Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Chaos Dwarf Q&A. Let's not waste any time and just jump straight into it. We're continuing today with questions about hobgoblins. Our first question is, without the hobgoblins, could the Chaos Dwarfs have defeated the Black Orc Rebellion? No. The hobgoblins played a critical role in that battle. By interrupting the momentum of the Greenskins, which is very important to how they fight, and more crucially, turning the captured Chaos Dwarf siege weapons back against the Greenskins, or just outright disabling slash destroying them. Once the Greenskins were tripped up by the chaos caused in that initial strike, the Dawizar were able to sweep out and deal a series of devastating blows that ultimately turned the tide. Without the betrayal of the Hobgoblins, the Chaos Dwarfs would have been exterminated, as they were completely pinned in on the upper levels of the Ziggurat of Vingolzar Nagrund and didn't have the numbers or firepower to deal with the Rebellion. When you're easily outnumbered at least 100 to 1, if the enemy manages to level out the difference in technology by capturing your weapons and using them against you, that's pretty much game over. The Hobgoblins were just criti beyond critical. They were the deciders of how that battle was going to end. And unfortunately for the Greenskins, the Hobgoblins thought it would be better to earn the favor of the Chaos Dwarfs than to just be the casual middle of the pack or punching bags of the orcs like most goblins are. Next question. Could I explain more about how greenskin spores work in regard to what determines the type of greenskin that will emerge from them? So for instance, why are there only hobgoblins found in the eastern world? We covered this quite thoroughly during the Greenskins Q&A series, I think in the biology section that you can find in that playlist. But to briefly touch up on the topic, the way a Greenskins type is determined is somewhere between two major factors. The first is the species of the parent Greenskin, for I have yet to see an instance where an orc suddenly sprouts up among an area dominated by a goblin tribe or a hobgoblin popping up from an area dominated by squigs. The second is the environmental factors present around the spores when they grow. For instance, night goblin and squig spores always grow deep in the earth in incredibly dark caverns. I suspect that the former is the greatest factor. Hobgoblins have a unique position in greenskin culture as they're so utterly despised by all other subspecies that there's just this massive divide there. The hobgoblins never interact with their distant kin unless it's for war. As such, the only greenskin spores found in the lands of the hobgoblins are, well, other hobgoblin spores. That being said, the hobgoblins are not the only greenskins found in the Far East. They're merely the dominant species on the eastern steppes. Far to the direct south is Noblar country, which is dominated by, you guessed it, Noblars. And there are millions of greenskins to be found in the Darklands, the Mountains of Morn, and further afield. One of the greatest conflict zones is actually the Wolflands where the roving wolf riding tribes of both goblins and hobgoblins face off against one another in colossal running battles, seeking dominance of these wide open lands from time to time. Moving on. What are hobgoblins, and how exactly does their relationship with the Chaos Dwarfs function? I probably should have started with this question, but hobgoblins are a subspecies of the Greenskins race that are on the goblin side of the spectrum. They stand a bit taller than other goblins, and are noted for appearing emaciated due to how lanky and awkward their physiology is, with their kind of long arms and just the way they stand with a bit of a hunch. Hobgoblins are immensely cruel and sadistic in nature, though honestly that applies to all of goblin kind. But their most famous attribute is just how damn treacherous they are. Craven and self-serving in the extreme, there is no depth a hobgoblin won't skulk to in order to further their own agenda, and it could be argued that even a skaven is more trustworthy. The hobgoblins are so incredibly fond of backstabbing 
that they have literally evolved a bone plate in the center of their backs to turn aside all but the most determined blades, which gives them that slight humpback. This is also why all hobgoblins have various scars in that location from past attempted stabbings, and you can generally tell how old or, say, powerful in rank a hobgoblin is by how many scars he has on that hump. As to their relationship with the Chaos Dwarfs, ultimately the Dawizar are clever bastards, and after the whole Black Orc Rebellion incident, they swiftly realized that the Hobgoblins were now deeply hated by all the other Greenskins for robbing them of what would have been the greatest wah of the age. The Hobgoblins of the Darklands were heading towards a violent extinction, unless they had someone to protect them. Someone like the Chaos Dwarfs. So the Drathzar decided to play on the nature of the Hobgoblins, and offered them the role of being favored lackeys. They're the overseers, slave masters, and tribute collectors of the Chaos Dwarfs, thus being spared from the most brutal and physically taxing labors. It's only when their masters are desperate for more troops, or just need cannon fodder, that they call upon the Hobgoblin tribes to function as soldiers. But there are always more than enough, as like all Greenskins, the population of the Hobgoblins is massive. Functionally though, they're just the slaves that are treated the best. The Hobgoblins get to cruelly bully and torture others to their heart's content, and are allowed to live around the Darklands in their own settlements and such without much harassment. The Chaos Dwarfs will occasionally obliterate one of these population centers, or execute a particularly driven individual to remind the Hobgoblins who's their master though, and who they should fear. Moving on, this is the last question for this section. Is the Hobgoblin Khanate an ally of the Dawizar? What's the relationship between these two empires? The Hobgoblin Khanate are not allies with the Chaos Dwarfs. If anything, they're probably more akin to enemies. The Hobgoblin Khanate are a nomadic people that enjoy riding hard across the Eastern Steppe and the Eastern Chaos Waste hunting whatever they come across, and bearing down with bow and blade riding giant wolves. Occasionally, a rare tribe or smaller group of wolf riders will approach the Chaos Dwarfs to offer themselves as mercenaries, but it's a tenuous relationship at best, as the Dawizar treat them little better than slaves, and the wolf riders are all too happy to abandon the battlefield if things seem to be going poorly. The Khanate tribes will regularly trade with Tsar Nagrind, however, arriving from the waste with long lines of slaves to exchange for higher quality weapons and armor. There is certainly a potential future in which the Chaos Dwarfs could lure the Hobgoblin Khanate to their side with a generous enough offering of treasures, but whether the Khanate would honor this bargain is another question entirely. The Chaos Dwarves know better than anyone never to trust a Hobgoblin with anything important or grant them a position of true power. So entering an alliance with an entire roving nation of Hobgoblin Wolfriders and their moving fortress wagons seems viable in only the most desperate of circumstances. That is just not a group you want to be relying on to be guarding a flank or being a critical component of your tactical plans. Alright, that wraps up the Hobgoblin, so now it's time to move on to warfare and tactics. The first question is a big one, so strap up. What are the preferred battle strategies of the Chaos Dwarfs? How do they tend to design their armies for war? And then there are a bunch of little questions that are kind of added on here, but we'll tackle them as we come across them. So, the primary strategy for the Chaos Dwarfs is extremely straightforward. They send out Hobgoblin Wolf Riders to scout out the enemy location and begin harassing exposed flanks with arrows if at all possible. Once the location of the battle has been figured out, the Dawizar will attempt to claim a hill or higher ground if at all possible and then set up their war machines to ready for battle. If they have one of the Iron Demons, the demon-powered train will have all the artillery drawn on carriages that will be carefully arrayed in a line to prepare for bombardments. 
The tried and true method will be to have a front line made up entirely of hobgoblins, who will be forced out into the open to draw enemy fire to waste ammunition and also bait out early engagements. Some of the hobgoblins will have spears, swords, or if they're lucky, bows that they've scavenged from who knows where that will be used to soften up the enemy as they come into range. Behind the hobgoblin screens will be the main force of the Chaos Dwarfs. Warriors equipped with a variety of weapons, but the most condensed group just behind the hobgoblins will be warriors with blunderbusses who will patiently wait for the hobgoblins to break and start running before opening fire to scythe down foe and green skin alike. A firing line of blunderbusses is devastating in its intensity and will blast apart all but the toughest of foes. Of course, from the moment the battle started, the Dawizar will be raining down hell from their various war machines, attempting to shatter the enemy's morale as well as their bodies. Dreadquake Mortars will seek out enemy fortifications, siege weapons, and large cavalry groups trying to flank. Magma Cannons will belch fiery death onto large monsters and heavily armored foes. And Death Shrieker Rocket Batteries will bombard the enemy army's core formation. As the enemy draws closer, longer range rifles such as the infamous Fire Glaives of the Infernal Guard will open fire as well as shoulder mounted Death Shrieker Rockets while Sorcerer Prophets and Demon Smiths will begin unleashing their terrible magics to tear apart the foe or slow their advance. Unless there's a strategic objective that needs to be captured hastily, the Chaos Dwarfs are all too happy to sit back and watch as their superior range capabilities tear apart the foe piece by piece. They will wait for the enemy to approach before finally prepping for melee and charging into the foe with curses upon their lips. Chaos Dwarf Warriors make up the bulk of the force, covered in heavy armor and wielding either great weapons or axe and shield in close combat once the foe is too close for blunderbuss bombardments. At the solid core of the army will reside the most durable infantry possessed by the Drath Tsar, either being the legendary immortals from Tsar Nagrand or the massed infernal guard from the Black Fortress maybe even the all-female Herodons that are briefly mentioned in the Wolfric novel. The Immortals are said to rely more upon wickedly barbed halberds, while the Infernal Guard march into battle wielding great weapons or hand weapons and shields like their warrior brethren. They're just a little better trained and a little better armed. These units are where the Castellans and Lords or Overlords of the Chaos Dwarfs will be marching around and barking out orders, while at the back can be found the Infernal Iron Sworn, wielding their darkly rune-powered weapons and wearing the absolute best armor to defend any sorcerer prophets or demon smiths that are standing on the battlefield. On the flanks will be the deadliest elements of Hashit's legions, often too volatile to be trusted with being at the core. Kadai Fireborn regiments are awakened to sate their fiery fury upon the foe with their molten claws, while Bull Centaur Renders charge into exposed flanks and enemy heavy cavalry to rip them apart in frenzied displays of gory violence. Either reinforcing the infantry or contesting key points on the battlefield will be the most horrifying titans the Dawizar can unleash, such as the Chaos Siege Giants or the Kadai Destroyers, which are more than a match for the strongest of monsters and capable of putting entire armies to flight. Finally, the skies will be dominated by the most powerful and wicked of the Sorcerer Prophets, riding into battle upon their chosen mount of either a demonic Taurus or a Sorceress Lamasu. Their tactics revolve entirely around softening up the foe at range and using hobgoblin hordes to buy precious time, until glorious bloody melee comes a calling where the entire legion will drive forward like an iron fist to punch straight through the enemy's weakened core to then devour what's left with terrifying creatures and devastating demon engines. Now I'll kind of address the side questions and I'll go ahead and read those off before answering them. So a couple of ones that were thrown in here were if the Chaos Dwarfs all combined into a single army, how powerful would it be and how far west would it go if it just plowed onwards? What's the best war mount for a Chaos Dwarf character to have? And how strong 
is the alliance between the Darizar and the Ironskin tribes. So, to answer all these questions, if the Darizar were to combine into a single force, they'd certainly be formidable, but they would only ever do so to guard Zarnagrand from some apocalyptic event. While they would undoubtedly number in the tens of thousands, such a force would be quite small compared to most of the other races in the Warhammer world gathering together themselves. But the Chaos Dwarves are much more likely to set their differences aside and combine into a singular force if a genuine threat to their capital presented itself. So, you know, they're one of the races that would actually do that as a defense mechanism. If for some bizarre reason they were to abandon Mingle Zarnagrun to go west, they could easily make it into the Empire and maybe even all the way over to the ocean if they had the element of surprise. But without it, I honestly think they'd wind up destroying themselves against the Dwarfs if the Dawi caught wind of such a legion heading towards them in far enough advance. The Dawis are just far better at defense than offense due to the numbers issue. If somebody knows they're coming and can pre prepare enough of a defense, especially at a battlefield of their choice, the Dawis are just have a lot working against them. As for the best war mount, uh, the Sorcerer Prophets are really the only ones that tend to take mounts, and the best one is without a doubt the Bale Taurus. That creature is essentially the very concept of fiery rage stuffed into the physical form of a colossal bull with massive wings that knows nothing besides hatred and hunger. A dragon makes for an easier opponent than a bale taurus by a decent margin, as the horrifying beasts are constantly shrouded in blazing flames that makes harming them a difficult prospect and even to stand near one is a fairly swift death by burning even if it never bothers to strike you. Stick an incredibly devious and powerful sorcerer on its back and you have a nightmarish combo that few things can easily contest. And then when it comes to the alliance between the Chaos Dwarfs and the Ironskin Ogres, it is said to be ironclad, pun intended, while the cruelness of the Dawizar and the mercurial nature of the Ogres likely means the two wouldn't bother aiding each other in most circumstances, they are nonetheless staunch trading partners and have an extremely vested interest in ensuring that trade stays open and profitable. I imagine if some enemies interrupted in such transactions by, say for example, laying siege to Mingles Arnagrund by surrounding it, there's a h extremely high chance that Gark Ironskin would lead his tribe down an incredibly angry charge to sort out this sudden disruption to his wealth. Alright, our next question is, what is the greatest military victory of the Chaos Dwarfs? What is their greatest defeat before the end times? The greatest defeat of the Chaos Dwarfs would easily have to be the Black Orc Rebellion. A moment in their history I'm sure the stunted creatures prefer to pretend never happened. If it hadn't been for the Hobgoblin's last minute betrayal of their fellows, there's zero doubt that the Dawizar were doomed to extinction, and the Temple of Hashet would have been cast down. While they technically did not lose at the end, I count it because the Chaos Dwarves weren't the ones who saved themselves, but rather were delivered by a bunch of treacherous greenskinned slaves. If you want to go by their actual full-on defeats, probably the most painful loss suffered by the Drathzar was when they attempted to invade Peak Pass to strike out at the Empire of Men. The legions of Hashet found themselves going to war against their hated western kin, the Dawi of the World's Edge Mountains refusing to allow such abominations to pass by Kalak Kadrin without a fight. After a colossal battle where fire and death rained upon both armies from artillery and brave warriors clad in Gromril or black shard armor gave no quarter as they butchered each other. Ultimately, the Chaos Dwarfs found their cruel demon engines and sorceries wanting and their invasion was repulsed, forcing the children of Hashit to flee back into the east. Now, the details of this battle and whether or not it's even still canon is messy. Technically, this conflict took place during the Storm of Chaos, which was an alternate timeline version of the End Times, 
but much of it was retconned out between 7th and 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy to make way for the end times. However, numerous events that originally featured as parts of the Storm of Chaos apparently still occurred, and this may well be one of them. The conflict makes a wonderful part of Masters of Stone and Steel, which is a great omnibus, when the holds of Zuthbar and Kalak Hadrin team up to face off against the Chaos Dwarfs. I think it's still a good battle to consider canon, as the Dawizar already get so few moments to be featured, and I like to think it's the battle where Ungrim Ironfist's son, Garagrim, was slain in battle after killing a corrupted Chaos Giant. Garagrim died during the events of the Storm of Chaos, and after the retcon for the end times, we learned that Garagrim still died in battle before the end times, but where and when is sort of just a big question mark. So there's a good option for you, and I can't recommend the Masters of Stone and Steel omnibus enough. You can find it on the Black Library website, or, you know, probably at book decent bookstores or online on eBay or whatever. As for their greatest victory, the Chaos Dwarfs have dealt some absolutely horrific blows to various civilizations across the planet. However, many of these victories were usually them surprising some city or countryside and blasting apart everything until no two stones were standing and then running back home with all the slaves they could capture. Rarely did the Dawizar engage in a longer war, and even then, they rarely played fair. But there was one war that determined the future of the Darklands entire that proved to be an incredible conflict. When the Empire of the Dawizar began to expand south and threaten the lands known as Noblar Country, they caused the native Greenskins to flee in terror, as the Noblars feared their enslavement. They fled into the Ogre Kingdoms, becoming a part of the culture of the Big Brutes over the next century, as luckily the Ogres found them to be useful servants and bad eating. However, the Chaos Dwarfs were now incredibly close to the territory of the Kingdoms, and attracted the attention of the Ogres who saw this conquering of the Darklands entire as a challenge. So, the Ogre Kingdoms went to war, with many tribes pouring out of the Mountains of Morn to join in the fighting, and those tribes more native to the Darklands fought to keep their territorial homes. A massive war broke out known as the Ash Battles, around 700 years before Sigmar's empire was founded, where the crushing charges, titanic monsters, and mighty powers of the Great Maw were matched up against the disciplined ranks, horrific war machines, and sorcerous might of Hashet. The war lasted for roughly 30 years, and while a great many Chaos Dwarfs were eaten alive or crushed beneath the tread of primordial beasts, the Ogres were forced back in a series of bitter conflicts. Ultimately, the Chaos Dwarfs won every major battle, and finally forced the Ogres out of the Darklands entirely, which caused the Gluttons to consider attempts at crushing the smoldering Stunties not to be worth the effort an attitude that held for the following 3,000 years into the modern day. The Chaos Dwarfs unleashed such painful devastation that it put off an entire race who consider fighting to be an enjoyable sport living right next door to develop a cultural avoidance because the cost was just too high. Granted, this was the Ogres before they developed any knack for gunpowder technology, such as iron blasters or lead belchers or any of those things that may have even the conflict. But still, if that isn't an absurdly resounding victory, I don't know what is. Alright, next up, who are the leaders of the Chaos Dwarfs, the most powerful and special of characters? So, the true authority and ultimate power behind the modern era of the Chaos Dwarfs is none other than Astragoth Ironhand, the eldest living sorcerer prophet among the priesthood of Hashet. How old he is isn't well known, though there is zero doubt that he's well into the quadruple digits, perhaps even more ancient than Sigmar's empire itself. Regardless, Astragoth strikes a terrifying figure, 
as the copious amounts of magic he has channeled over the millennia to incinerate armies or forge nightmarish demon engines has resulted in much of his body turning to stone due to moments where the incredible gifts of Hashit briefly slipped out of his control. It is said that nearly all of his limbs are made of stone now, numerous cracks running all the way up to his face that leak out a hellish light. Iron Hand would long ago have been immobilized, but in his cruel genius, the Prophet of Hashit designed an impressive mechanical suit, powered by hissing steam and darker powers to force his paralyzed body into motion. Of course, he has augmented it to the extent that the suit vastly increases his strength to effortlessly shred the inferior armor of lesser races and crush all but the mightiest foes. As one of the most gifted sorcerer prophets at wielding the lore of Hashit, empowered by his mechanical suit that he only continues to improve upon with each passing year, and guarded by the triple threat of the highest quality armor a master demon smith can craft, an outer augment suit made from incredible metals, and most of his body having turned to solid stone, there is no individual as deadly or feared as Astragoth Iron Hand in Mingo Zarnathrund. There are, of course, other characters we've spoken about in past episodes, particularly during the meta slash design questions, but Iron Hand is the closest thing to a ruler among the Dawizar. None wield the power he possesses within Zarnagrund itself, and the only other Chaos Dwarf who rules with comparable authority outside of the capital is Draswath the Ashen, the Lord of the Black Fortress. Though he has been functionally exiled by the schemes of his rivals back in Mingo Zarnagrund, Draswath has long been planning to return in triumph as rumors flock to his fortress that Astrogoth's age seems to finally be getting to him after thousands of years of undeniable supremacy. Who knows what horrendous acts Draswath will take to try and secure glory so that he can return home at long last to claim power and authority when his former master and rival finally dies. Alright, let's keep trucking. Why is the Chaos Dwarf roster so much more diverse slash versatile than the Dwarf's one? Um, honestly, it just... Because ultimately the Chaos Dwarfs are not held back by notions of tradition. Where the Dwarfs constantly tug their beards in consternation whenever some master engineer proposes a new invention, requiring decades if not centuries of testing before even fielding the weapon in question, the Dawizar instead will dream up some horrific demon engine and have it out for live testing on their enemies within a handful of years. Furthermore, the Chaos Dwarves have a very twisted sense of honor, finding it perfectly acceptable to allow hordes of expendable hobgoblins to rush forward and get themselves killed to waste enemy munitions, while a proper dwarf would never be caught dead associating with greenskins for any reason. The Chaos Dwarves are just willing to accept more risks as well, utilizing sorcery and technology that is far too unreliable for their western kin to even consider viable. Ultimately though, as I said, it boils down to honor, I think. The children of the ancestor gods would literally rather die than stoop to many of the methods that the Chaos Dwarfs have embraced. That being said, in defense of the dwarfs, they do have a big monster, being the Shard Dragon, and some more exciting war machines like the Thunder Barge that Creative Assembly just hasn't brought into the game yet. So there's just not as big of a difference as people think. The biggest difference between the Chaos Dwarfs and the regular Dwarfs, in my opinion, is that the Chaos Dwarfs are willing to use Greenskins to grant them fodder infantry and scouting fast cavalry which is just not something the dwarves really have comparable to. Though I guess you could argue gyrocopters are kind of like scouting fast cab, but, you know, whatever. Alright, moving on. How does the Chaos Dwarf Empire compare to the others in the Warhammer world? Where are they in a hierarchy of strength? The worshippers of Hashit occupy a rather strange space in the global hierarchy of strength due to their immense power contained within a very small package. Pun intended. Honestly, in the grand scheme of things, the Dawizar are near the bottom of the totem pole when comparing empires due to just how small their population is. The whole thing is especially complicated as the Chaos Dwarves are a defensive empire. 
They prefer to build tall instead of wide and let their enemies come to them. In just a raw comparison, they're definitely one of the weakest empires, but when you account for the factors of their design being focused on defense, they're easily one of the strongest empires in the world, standing alongside the likes of the Dwarfs of the World's Edge Mountains and the Skaven and their Under Empire. And then the last question for today, are slaves utilized upon the battlefields by the Chaos Dwarfs? If so, what are the various types in their use? So, hmm. The Chaos Dwarfs will use Ogre Slaves to load the infamously heavy Dreadquake Mortars. And then Hobgoblins are basically slaves for all intents and purposes that make up the cannon fodder and expendable infantry of the Chaos Dwarfs. As very cheap archers, spearmen, fighters, and fast cavalry. They, they being the Chaos Dwarfs, don't actually utilize other types of slaves on the battlefield, as those are a valuable resource meant for the mines and forges, not to be wasted in open war. And the Hobgoblin Wolf Riders technically aren't slaves, but instead are more akin to mercenaries that act as fast cavalry and scouts. That's pretty much it. The Chaos Dwarfs are not Skaven. They don't like throwing away resources willy-nilly. If you go back into the older lore, they did use more greenskin types as further slave infantry. They used to be able to take a much wider roster of greenskin types, but that no longer seems to be the case in modern writings. I mean, if you go back to, I think, 5th edition, they had Black Orc slaves, which doesn't really make sense when you take into account the whole Black Orc Rebellion and how bad that entire situation got. Uh, personally, I definitely prefer the modern interpretation where they use the slaves as a resource and not something to just be bled out on the fields of battle. That That's a waste of their money as far as they're concerned. Like, ho using hobgoblins is one thing, but hobgoblins also aren't the manual of labor and the things that keep the industry of Tsar Nagrund and the Chaos Dwarf Empire churning. To use those slaves in battle, that would just be silly, as far as the Chaos Dwarfs are concerned. They would much rather consolidate their resources. Alright guys, that's going to be it for today's episode. So, based on kind of how we're trucking, honestly, I think this is the second to last episode. I'm kind of just jumping through my document. Um, the next episode might be a little bit longer, or maybe... I'm not sure, it's hard to gauge. But yeah, I feel 100% certain that next episode will be the final prepared episode, I should say. Um, there will be one more episode after that where I basically go over some information that I learned in the comment section from some really, really dedicated Chaos War fans. Um, Eric the Red, I'll just shout out being the, one of the big primary ones that I've seen popping up in a lot of the videos. Uh, where, I mean, there is a very passionate Chaos Dwarf community that works very, very hard to just get their hands on every nitty gritty piece of info. And they found a couple of cool things that I accidentally missed. Um, because I forgot to read through Man of War, because I didn't think about Man of War. <laughs> and, uh, also I read through Wolfric too fast. And had to go back and reread some passages. So I will be kind of going over some of the things that I should have gone over better to just add that information on and then after that um we will be doing a live stream where i will just be hanging out with everyone on twitch to just talk about chaos dwarfs and try to answer any questions that people have that were not addressed by the playlist so thank you all so much for watching i hope you're looking forward to the grand finale where we will be finishing up the warfare and tactics session and then diving on to hash it himself so thank you all again so much for watching i'll see you tomorrow for the last big episode and then you know everything after that catch you guys later